Welcome, thank you for joining us today for our first webinar 2022. We are very happy today to have the opportunity to cover one of the topics for this year. Of course, for January, there has been a lot of talks on the future outlook for the fixed income world. I'm here today with Filippo Lanza, founder of Numen Capital and portfolio manager for our Edge Invest Numen Credit Fund. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to you, Filippo. Of course, everyone can use the chat for uh, having questions. We are very happy to make it very interactive so that it becomes also more interesting and useful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thanks, everybody, for um, dedicating us the time for this update. Um, as you can see from the title of the the, the the question we're trying to answer we and the solution we're trying to offer our investor is um, how can a fixed income investor uh, survive uh, a perfect storm? And uh, 2022 seems like a bit of a perfect storm. We had uh, a potential, you know, monetary tightening, you know, energy crisis in Europe. You know, uh, now we're talking about invasion uh, from Russia into Ukraine. Um, and you know, our simple answer to that is that the only solution is an active management. We do expect much more volatility going forward. Uh, and I think we need to accept that we're going to have more volatility in our returns. But that's also the, the condition, I think, the right condition to actually perform much better uh, going forward. And I think there'll be plenty of opportunity, both on the macro and on the idiosyncratic side. Uh, Laura, if you come, well, this is the a bit of a you know uh, a comic that we found, which was quite quite interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of of focus on COVID. Uh, our view there remains the one we've been holding consistently since the eruption of COVID in in 2020. It, it, at the end of the day, it was a great opportunity to buy. You know, COVID would have been uh, managed, and that would have allowed reopening. We still think the same, and that's why the book is still positioned with some. Uh, smart reopening trades, um, especially in stress credits, which we think would, would perform pretty well. Obviously, the issue now is that a lot of investors are waking up to the other problem, which is inflation, which has been pretty much like a dormant issue for the best part of the last two decades. Uh, and not only that, but uh, has seen a massive monetary expansion. So the real issue here is, is inflation enough to derail that sort of monetary stance, even to reverse it and then bring quantity tightening, that, that's the biggest question that we need to try to answer. Um, if we move to page three, we're trying to you know, put the two questions which are relevant here. The first one is, is the inflation structural or temporary? Does the, you know, the, has been you know, going on, the narrative was temporary before, now people more talk more about structural issue. And then obviously, are the central banks massively behind the curve? So. Our main principle to look at all of these is, is twofold. The first one, central banks only matter to the extent that they change their balance sheet. The balance sheet expansion is what made the financial markets that we know over the last 10 years, and a balance sheet reduction would obviously reverse that. Are we seeing a balance sheet reduction right now or not, and when is going to happen? Obviously, if we look at, you know, uh, Europe, Japan, China, it looks like we're very much like in the old mode. Uh, the US has communicated that they may be reducing the balance sheet, but as of now, not much. So the market has been predominantly moving because of the Fed hike expectation. And that's always very important. So we think central banks and the market will become much more data dependent. And I think the picture on the data is not that clear cut. We do see a decent growth, obviously partially driven by the big stimulus from COVID and all that. Uh, but obviously, there are some several several issues out there. Obviously, there's been a lot of supply chain disruption, which we think will be removed, most of it, thanks to the um, COVID becoming more like kind of endemic than pandemic, and obviously having plenty more drugs to, to deal with it. Uh, but on the other side, we see a lot of slowdown in China due to the real estate. Uh, China for us is uh, our you know, structural bearish position. Uh, we, li we do like some of the tech stocks from time to time, especially versus NASDAQ, like Alibaba and so on, but only as an opportunistic trade like we did last year. Overall, we're very negative on China uh, because the exposure to real estate and the problems they're going through real estate, which we think 
uh, the current leadership will be very challenged to deal with. Um, so that's one position for us. But China, per se, the slowdown could really impact central bank policy going forward. On top of that, obviously, in Europe specifically, we have a potential invasion of Ukraine. And unfortunately, within the probability of that happening has clearly increased over the last few years for a variety of, of issues. And so where does it leave us? It leaves us to be very opportunistic and very disciplined. So year to date, we did well on the macro side on short fixed income. It was a strong conviction. We probably made close to 2%, including what we made on the call option on the banking stocks. It worked well, but we thankfully closed very uh, correctly when we saw the, the fixed income market losing momentum on the selling off. So if you actually look at the fixed income market versus the equity, the fixed income market tells you that they do attach a decent probability to a policy mistake or uh, over tightening with a massive slowdown coming up. We don't know who's right, whether it's the equity market that still believes it's going to be growth and earnings, and earnings uh, um, increases or the fixed income market. So the only way we can do is actually to be very you know, opportunistic, very data dependent. When we look at the macro, we still think there's plenty of opportunity to short. I think the best short is still uh, in fixed income uh, on the macro side. Um, the shorts we like, obviously, being in China, uh, we very much like BTP as a tactical short, especially if the political picture there deteriorates. And then obviously on very selected idiosyncratic investment grade and I yield names that we're short. So if we look at this, obviously, um, it's, it's, it's our view on what has been kind of the assets uh, performance over the last 10 years. Any kind of long only strategies work pretty much well if you held it for like more than a year. Um, and obviously, that's been very correlated in our view with the balance sheet expansion, whether it's crypto assets, NFT, or, you know, NASDAQ stock. Um, it's been very much like uh, the, the, the outcome, the results, the balance sheet expansion. So that is why that is key to us. If that balance sheet expansion uh, keep on being increased or not. And obviously that's a big question. So for us is a cash flow issue. So if central banks start selling their assets, that's a very aggressive quantity tightening. If they start reducing massively their assets purchase, there will be as well quantity tightening. If they keep on going like that, I think it's pretty much like a, an, a, an extension of the status quo, which means the current correction is pretty more like temporary uh, rather than structural. But obviously, if we go into a QT, I think we see a massive like downside from here. And if we move to the next page, we're trying to um, uh, synthesize on what, what are the kind of ranges that we're looking at. And if we use as a benchmark the previous tantrum periods of 2013, 2018, Obviously, we, we see a decent sell-off in credit, investment grade, and a yield uh, with negative performance of anywhere in the region of 2 to 3%, all the way to 10 And then, obviously, we, on the rates, it depends on your duration. But obviously, there's a lot of duration. There's a lot of debt. The big question mark, obviously, will be on the S&P and, and how much that moves, especially if growth is, is deteriorating. And then obviously in the, the previous time we've seen price earnings as a kind of benchmark going down to 14 from 20. Um, so obviously we have, you know, potential 20, 30% decrease there on the equity side. Um, where, where are we going to go? It's very much data depend. I think data and event depend. Obviously there are some events like geopolitical picture, like Russia, Ukraine, um, there are some big macro macro situation like real estate in China. We will have to monitor them and we'll have to monitor how COVID um, relief and how COVID um, restriction lifting is affecting the uh, inflationary aspect of the economy. Because we may have a very you know, uh, quick correction on the inflation side and a slowdown on the economy, which is mildly bearish, but we could also have a very bearish scenario where there is stagflation, i.e. inflation being very strong and growth being very, very uh, impaired. Uh, if we move on to the next page is we're trying to summarize how we deal with this. Where, where is our focus? On the macro side, we are very tactical. You know, we try to be data dependent and follow the situation. So um, year to date, we're down around 2%. Most of it is because we probably made around two and a half on the um, uh, 
efforts on fixed income, which we initiated at the beginning of the year. And then we took off uh, when we saw the momentum stopping. And then obviously we remark on our, our idiosyncratic position. So in a way, our performance is uh, an expression of those two kind of strategy. On the macro side, we, you know, we trade actively opportunistically and you know, we try to take profit when we can and we're very disciplined. On the other side, the idiosyncratic, we're trying to stick with views that we really like. And we've done very similar to what we did in March of 2020. You know, we had a, a short book that performed pretty well, but on the long book, we kept what we really strongly believe in. Like for example, anything which has got related to the energy transition, uh, battery and lithium suppliers, some of the you know, very uh, heavily discounted convertible and uh, uh, companies in the uh, 5G and telecom sector. Anything that we really believe in it, we, we kind of keep it and we um, trying to fine tune that position with the macro. Going forward, we think that's going to be uh, something that we're going to see plenty. So we're going to see a lot of macro events where you need to be very active uh, trading them. Uh, and on the other side, you're going to have plenty of reducing crash situation where uh, the liquidity discount may increase, uh, but that will create plenty of opportunity to establish long or short position. So that's our focus on, obviously we have a strong track, strong track record on, on stress and distress position over the last 20 plus years. And we do think we're going to see plenty of that. In the following slides, this one and number uh, page eight, obviously we're trying to give a bit of a, um, of a snapshot of some of the position that we're looking at that we really like. Um, for example, the, the first one will be Aurora, which is a, a Canadian cannabis producer. And we've been very involved with them over the last two years. Um, they traded in a very big range, volatile range. Obviously there's been a lot of structural change in the cannabis side. You know, we have been involved with this name, both from the long and short side. Now we have established a small long position. I think there's plenty of refinancing opportunity and that's what we set up. Um, uh, these names currently is yielding around 15% for the portfolio. We have a portfolio overall that is probably having, just in terms of current yield, probably close to 4% on a yearly basis. But obviously we have all this portfolio of idiosyncratic position that very much don't depend on, on QT or, or any big macro um, um, drivers, but they would, would work pretty well. Um, the second thing we are focusing our attention is arrival. You know, the price there is wrong, it's much less now, it's probably yielding again close to 15, 16%. We love to get into through convertibles, especially stress to stress, because they give a lot of upside if the equity kicker comes in. We view them as very well protected from a credit point of view because they just did the fundraising. And we like companies that got like a fast um, executing um, kind of business plan, especially when it comes down to energy transition. Arrival is obviously a big EV startup. Uh, they're developing a new Uber car. They are very well positioned to be uh, an impressive uh, player in the EV space. Um, we can then, you know, move to the second page just to show some more like kind of infrastructure, structure plays. Uh, if you look at that, obviously we're very involved with Dish and we are all in Brazil. Um, those are kind of telecom player. We really like their presence in their markets. Uh, we think the recovery rate is very high on those bonds, so the downside is relatively limited. But then again, there's plenty of upside from <clears throat> M&A and refinancing opportunity. At the same time, we're trying to have inflation edges in the book. A uh, perfect example will be GSM, which is a um, um, commodity producer. Actually, they do um, um, industrial silicon. And um, that's a name that we've been involved with the restructuring a couple of years ago. We exited the equity at very good levels, but we kept the bonds as we think there's enough pricing power being moved there. So that's one way we're trying to do in the book is to prepare to create inflation uh, optionality for us as in benefit from inflation. Hovnian is another name that we really like, a um, uh, residential home builder in the States, uh, in great cash flow generation, got out of restructuring, they, they're doing extremely well. Uh, what I'm trying to say with these snapshots is that just to give you an idea how diversified the portfolio is, there's plenty of different positions we, we, we're coming to see on the long side. Obviously, we have a few shorts which we didn't bring into the presentation uh, for a variety of reasons, but there is plenty of stuff that you can get now anywhere between 10 to 15 percent current um, yield to maturity with plenty of catalyst. And on the other side, we find great shorts on uh, investment grade names or names that will be exposed badly to the inflation side on top of the other macro. 
perfect example is, is EDF, is the name we are short, we're short through the perps, we're short through CDS. We think the hit on their EBITDA is, is, is shockingly high. Uh, we think there's going to be very little the government is going to do in the very immediate short term because the election in April. Uh, we think EDF is a perfect example to show how we can play through the capital structure. It's a big company, it's liquid. We can move very quickly from being short to long if and when the situation changes. We think is potentially also a very um, badly hit name in the case of energy crisis in Europe deteriorating because of an invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, if we then move on to page 10, uh, a quick word on ESG. Obviously, ESG is a big, big issue in the investment community. Um, what is ESG integration at Newman? We are not uh, Article 8 and 9 compliant, but we are increasingly spending a lot of time on ESG. Um, personally, I you know, study for the CFA uh, on ESG, and uh, although obviously the S and the G, especially the G has been a, a dominant driver in our investment process over the years, uh, particularly in, in credit where there's a lot downside from bad G plays like Wirecard or uh, Warcom on Aaron. Uh, the E and the S is something that we've been devoting more and more resources over the last few years, especially E we think is the biggest driver for the market going forward. Um, we think there'll be plenty of uh, situations where the energy transition will keep on going. Um, it will be probably accelerated, unfortunately, by bad events like we had in the past with uh, Fujama in 2011 in Japan, uh, where or with other, you know, meteorological or climatic uh, uh, accidents, which unfortunately we uh, do expect. So that is one big thing for us. We're spending a lot of time on what we think are the best ESG long short peaks, not much for their rating, which we don't really believe too, too much in, but more in like, are these guys going to be a winner because of what's happening on the east side? And we have plenty of those names in the book. Um, the lithium is one of the places where we see massive supply chain, uh, supply imbalances, uh, and we see as, as as an essential piece into energy transition. And that's one of the names we, and only we kept, but we've been increasing over the over the this recent market carnage. Obviously, be plenty of opportunity in ESG in terms of rating arbitrage. You know, ESG is becoming very much like another rating, like another credit rating dimension. And obviously, as always, there's plenty of uh, arbitrage between improving ESG, deteriorating ESG in terms of long and short. Um, I then close. I then close with the last um, page, uh, which is uh, dedicated to a new kind of platform we develop in terms of. Uh, uh, investor relationship. Obviously, we are trying to have a more granular, more detailed, and more frequent dialogue with our investors. Uh, partially is to make you aware of what we're doing and, and keep you happier from an understanding point of view of the book and of the risk uh, they are in it. But also, obviously, to uh, for us in a selfish way because we found uh, a constructive data with investor very uh, relevant, very useful in terms of combining market views and, and fine tuning our, our approach. Um, with this, I conclude and I remain uh, uh, available obviously for any, any questions that you may have. Thank you, Filippo. So please use the chat if you want to make question. In the meanwhile, a question related to the ESG. Uh, we understand that is, uh, I mean, uh, this is a discussion that is emerging now in the market that the ESG can have an impact on inflation. How much do you think this is true? And so we, will we have uh, uh, consistently higher inflation just because of the ESG going forward? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the ESG obviously is inflationary. We, we've been saying that for, for some, some time. Um, obviously, on the S and the G aspects in terms of, you know, company compliance, disclosure, and obviously, you know, changes in terms of process and protocols from, from, from a company owned investor point of view. I think the impact overall is relatively meaningless in terms of cost of capital, but I think the E obviously is a big, big driver, you know, transition to, you know, um, net zero carbon emission or negative carbon emission obviously will be a big, big driver. Um, and that's one of the reasons obviously we are worried about Russia now, because if you, Russia, you know, you have a depleting uh, a pool of capital, which is your uh, oil and gas. And if you want, if you want to play it, you want to play it now uh, before energy transition get, get rid of you. So on one side, yes, is inflationary. On the other side, similarly to what we've seen with, you know, the ability of the humanity to produce COVID vaccines in, in 12 months, 
when the expectation was for three years. Uh, I think obviously there's a lot of technological developments that are really, really impressive. So you look at the uh, electricity production in UK and how fast and how faster actually and better uh, the, the actual wind uh, production has been than expected, it, it's impressive. And that's obviously because technological advancements. I think about solar planner, panels now that are even creating like windows, transparent windows with solar panels in it. So yes, it's inflationary, uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of technological induced deflation. So net, net, it, it depends. I think there'll be massive winners and massive losers. You know, I think now if you if you own lithium or if you own, you know, any any material that you need for the energy transition, I mean, those, you know, it, it does just, you know, monopolies. And, and I think will be plenty, plenty more going through. I think um, we will, we will as an humanity, I think we'll move closer and closer to that. I think what will be much more inflationary and disruptive will be climatic changes. I'm not an expert. I don't know. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few years we have more of that. Um, and that obviously will impact and accelerate the energy transition. I think, you know, uh, a Russian invasion of Ukraine, although it would be amazing for gas and oil at the beginning, uh, because obviously the, the price will skyrocket, and we already have established a few shorts on some electricity and energy companies. They are very dependent, although that will be the immediate impact. I mean, if you think about long term, they will be kind of, you know, the a turbo acceleration of energy transition. So you will probably have solar panels, you know, subsidized or wind farms or, you know, micro nuclear power plant or micro wind, wind farms everywhere. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the E is the biggest driver to me and the energy transition is the biggest driver um, that that's happening. I think Europe is particularly exposed to that, both, you know, uh, from, from an energy point of view, because obviously, you know, we, we have very little nuclear uh, we getting out of that, and at the same time, we're very much reliant on gas and oil. So Europe is a very, very fragile moment. Um, but and on the other side, obviously, the investment the investor community in Europe is much more focused. So I think you know, from an investment point of view, you need to really be focused on that because it's real. Uh, but at the same time, you need to focus on that because there'll be plenty of arbitrage. There'll be companies that are going up because they're perceived to be good ESG guys. But it's going to be like rating. Yeah, it's a triple B, but actually we think a single B. So let's have a big short on. And that's how our approach for now is pretty unconstrained, but very focused on ESG. Thank you. A question for the macro side. Do you have any edges on UK today? UK currently, no. We've been trading gilts from the short side at the beginning of the year, and we did pretty well, and we close it. Uh, we have big shorts on the banking system in UK, but those are more UK, China exposed, so Standard and Charter, HSBC, uh, where we really believe we plenty. Um, UK, we still think, you know, they, they, they haven't really seen the full impact of Brexit, and I think they will come. Uh, we think UK is probably the most inflation-prone country out there. So we really like to play the gilts, but as I said at the very beginning, we're very disciplined. So we basically capture almost 2% of the shorts. We crystallize it, liquidate it, and then we use it to mark down the book on the other stuff. Um, do we think we're going to do it again on gifts? Definitely. I think, you know, UK will be one of the one of the countries where we see an enormous amount of, of capital needs that need to be refinanced every day. So it's either the sterling or the guilt. One of the two will, will have to move in the next 12 months. In terms of the liquidity environment for January, uh, what did you observe on the market and uh, an impact for, uh, for your portfolio? In terms of liquidity, I think the stuff we have is, is relatively liquid. I mean, I think on the macro side, whatever we've done from BTP yields, all the rest seems stays still very, very liquid, definitely for our size. Um, and I think that I haven't really seen much I think on the on the other side, on the credit side, you know, most of the names, you know, whether we are long and short, being relatively liquid. The bid, we haven't seen major disruption in terms of bid off or anything. Um, I think if and when we see that kind of you know liquidity crisis, obviously we're monitoring very much the crypto space uh, because obviously there's a lot of retail that's been into Nasdaq and crypto space. So we're trying to see how that pans out. But on, on, on the market overall, I think the market, especially credit in Europe, uh, but US as well, have been very, very orderly, very orderly. I mean, the one thing that really, you know, in a way, disappoint us badly, but is that, you know, in the last two months of last year, 
uh, which is the last three months for us, we, we, we had uh, a risk trigger uh, loss cutting on short, uh, such as AMC at 40. And Friday, we closed some small put option at when, the, when the stock was 17. Um, so whether we were Peloton, Netflix, all names we had shorts on last year, all names we had cut, cut loss because of the risk call, um, which is the one thing obviously we need to be prepared to have a little bit more volatility on some of the shorts. Um, those are names that we've been structurally short. The only one we kept because again, it was probably much more uh, manageable was Tesla and that played out okay. But um, overall, I think um, on the liquidity side, especially for what we do, which is long short, the big we may see a decrease in, of liquidity on the long, but I think you know the one thing as we've seen in any other crisis from you know 94, 97, 2001, I mean the the, the liquidity in the book will come from the shorts. So Filippo, just uh, uh, I mean you mentioned now, but just a comment on uh, on the contribution for the portfolio in the last quarter of uh, of last year, uh, so that just to make understand uh, why performance was it in the latest part, even if at yeah. the end we close with a very good result. Yeah. Most of them were short. Then we we basically we got cut off on um, between the end of October, beginning of November, with big position macro on Russell S and P. And you know every time you know we eventually started them off, and probably had too much, too tight um, uh, cut, loss cutting events, and, and then we cut on them, and then then we suffer. And some others we had a few like one small event position on Pinterest, which was very small, but actually went down quite a lot. But we kept it because we really like it, and we had it market neutral now. And so in, in, uh, I suppose that just to close for, for our audience, do you see 2022 more, uh, more opportunities on the macro for the shorts uh, or on the long part of the portfolio or, uh, or both? I, I, I really see both. I think there'll be plenty on macro as we, you know, we made money this month and it's the best way for us. We made the money crystallized, liquidated and remarked down a portfolio now that could make, you know, 10, 20%. So I really like the macro, but it will be very ruthless and very volatile, you know, like you have, you have to trade it, you have to have stop loss, profit taking numbers in your mind. And on the idiosyncratic, it will be fantastic because I think, you know, be plenty of, of premium discount or discount, liquidity discount on some position. You can pick them up. And as long as the catalysts are right, you're going to be able to make a lot of money and some structural trend, whether it's energy transition, ESG, or, 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 or some of them are there to stay. So as long as you are in the right trend and with the right kind of position, you will still be able to make a lot of money on the idiosyncratic as well. Definitely not a simple static long portfolio. That, that I think is it's not going to be the case. Good. So with this, I think we covered the question we had from the audience. Uh, hopefully also this year would be very good for the fund. We think this environment is, uh, is very positive. So volatility will play on our side going forward. Uh, and so we also hope that you will use the, the website. We'll circulate the link so that uh, the dialogue between uh, Filippo and investors and interested counterparty could be more productive uh, than, uh, than ever. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank, Thank you, Filippo. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.